This will be our 16th message in the series on the table of the Lord. I'm going to extend this one more sermon. There's another, uh, another word I want to deliver on it. That will be the last one. The, it will be the environment in which the Lord's Supper was instituted. Eating and drinking unworthily. Well, it might seem strange that such a text as this is in the Bible. It contradicts uh, a lot of theology. That someone who's made worthy could be guilty of doing something so critical as remembering Christ in an unworthy manner. See, this, this is in the scripture and it gives us a perspective we need to actually have. The gravity of this or seriousness of this ordinance is seen in the close scrutiny heaven has of its participants. This lifts it far, far above like just a mere routine or ceremony or ritual. Anytime God determines by looking at a person worthy, unworthy, that means he's scrutinizing the participants very closely. So that tells you what kind of ordinance this is here. This is not just a church activity. If I do the knowing the scriptures I do, I am afraid, mortally afraid, of conducting myself improperly at this table. Amen. Or of walking out on it. Amen. Now people can say I'm legalistic, they can say whatever they want, but that's just the way it is. I am afraid to offend God Amen. by not remembering his son. <clears throat> the death is of such magnitude to God, the death of Christ is of such magnitude to God in both its necessity and its effectiveness that God will not allow, allow haphazard involvement to go unchallenged. Yeah. He's going to tell the Corinthians, he's going to interpret some of their conditions. He's going to tell them they were sick and weakly and died because of this very thing we're talking about here tonight. So this is, uh, this is a table very close to scrutinized by God. Uh, he, uh, this is not generally understood. People are generally concerned with should I, shouldn't I, how often do I have to, do I really have to be... That makes it, those questions make a person unworthy. And yet in this text, God doesn't give anybody the option of not taking it. Amen. If you're in Christ, you've got no choice on this matter. You are obligated by the Son of God to eat at this table. Amen. But you don't have an option not to. And to stand before God, can you imagine standing before God and having to account for the fact that you challenged whether it was necessary to remember Christ or that you should only remember him once in a while or occasionally? Could you imagine having to answer for that? Well, actually, there's a sense in which you have to answer for it now. So at this table is a certain manner of life is determined and judged by God right here. At this table. Now as we've noted, due preparation is mandated. You can't do this like a son of spur of the moment type thing. There's a proper attitude. This do. Now here's the attitude. In remembrance. Of me. It's First Corinthians eleven twenty five. And you're you're saying you're making a statement here. Not necessarily to one another, although in a sense that's true. It certainly isn't to the world because they don't see you doing it. 
But you're making a statement to heaven. Yes, that's right. At this table here. You're declaring or showing forth the Lord's death. Yeah. Amen. It isn't to other men, unless it's among ourselves. This is not the kind of declaration that's in the gospel to preach the gospel to every creature. It's not that kind of declaration. This is a declaration to God. I believe the record you've given of your son. Amen. I accept your testimony about what Jesus did and what he, who he is and where he is and what he's doing. And I confess it doesn't make any sense to live for anybody else. And to neglect this, to neglect this son. Father, I refuse to do it. I'll declare your son. I'll not hide him. These people modify their lives to please the ungodly. Yeah. That's the opposite of declaring. Amen. Making it known. And there's a pro this proper declaration of the Lord's death. We just show forth his death. That particular facet of the gospel, his death, because his death, everything hinges on his death. If he doesn't die, he doesn't rise. If he doesn't die, he's not a suitable high priest. If he doesn't die, he can't go back to heaven. Because <laughs> he was saying to die and take up his life again. If he doesn't die, he's disobedient. If he doesn't die, sin's not forgiven. If he doesn't die, the new covenant's not put in place. If he doesn't die, there's no peace between God and man. If he doesn't die, men aren't reconciled. See, this is a critical death. Amen. I really... I'm concerned about this, but I don't think some people see this. They just plain are too casual yes. about this table. Too sloppy about it. And there's a proper anticipation of Christ's return is heightened at this table. We show forth his death till he come. See, we're look we're looking forward. Amen. I know it's it's nice to be able to say we always ought to remember Christ is coming again. It's our business to think about Christ coming again. And that's all true, but that's also what I call yap. You got to do something that declares that. That's, this is one thing we do here. The fact that we declare his death confirms we're looking forward to his coming. Because his death is what makes his coming a blessing. If it wasn't for his death, his coming wouldn't be a blessing to anybody. And it isn't going to be a blessing to anybody who didn't see his death right. Yeah. Coming's going to be terrible. Mm -hmm. yeah. Fearful. Yeah. And condemning to anybody else. Here at this table, there are searchings. We examine ourselves to see some evidence of divine working. Where yeah. Yeah. Looking to see what God's wrought in us. I regret that there are people that have not taught God's people to do this. To, to look, they just look for something wrong. They make each other this accountability thing, which is a lot of nonsense, but making each other accountable. It's never make each other accountable to discover what God's done in you. It's never that. <laughs> it's never that. It's make each other accountable for your sin and so you won't sin. But it's never accountable so you will remember and so you will live. God. It's never accountable for that. Never! Why not? Because flesh can't capitalize on something like that. Flesh can only capitalize on don'ts. Can't capitalize on do's. See, all that take place at this, at this table here. So it, so our text should make perfect sense then. He that eateth and drinketh unworthily. It is a very resting word. Unworthily. What, what does it mean? Well, some of the various versions state it different ways. An unworthy manner. In the wrong spirit. In an unworthy way. In an improper way. Inter International English says with a wrong attitude. 
Sanctuary Bible says, a way that isn't worthy of the Lord. Like standing before a king with your shirt hanging out and in an uncomely manner, yeah. without due respect. Yeah. In a way that does not fit its meaning, English Revised Version, in a way that dishonors him, Good News Bible, irreverently, <coughs> the Message Bible. So it's not, here what you do isn't the point, it's how you do it that's the point. Yeah. See, so that's all right now. That, <laughs> that changes, the legalist can't think this way. See, a legalist never thinks of how. Mm -hmm. He always thinks of what. All the time. This, this is what legalism does. Do you follow the follow proper pattern? Mm -hmm. Here we're talking about having the proper attitude. So you can follow the proper pattern with your teeth clenched and your fists clenched. But you just did it anyway because God said to do it. And I'm, I'm here because God told us to be here and that's it. That's the wrong attitude. It should be thankfulness, not grumbling. I said, Land, look how late it's getting. I got to get out of here. I got other things to do. Now, a person that does that, I mean, we may love these people and all that, but a person that does this, God didn't overlook that. In other words, there's uh, not discerning the Lord's body, not, not recognizing the Lord's body. One version says. Another says, don't judge his body right. Not being conscious that it's the Lord's body. Not distinguishing the Lord's body. Darby says, without careful regard for the Lord's body. And that Bible says, Tyndale said, maketh no difference of. That is, this is no different than eating the meal. And not recognized with due appreciation, Amplified Bible says. So in other words, the person who sits at this table has to make a correlation between the bread and the body. And between the cup and the blood. Yeah, amen. They've got to view this as, as though you had Christ's body in your, in your hand, at your disposal. And you're, you're determined not to crucify him like the Jews did. Mm. Jesus was put into their hands. You've got to view this like that, like Jesus is in your hand. It'll change now what you do. This is how you, but people who are not able to make that correlation are not able to make the bridge between the bread and the body of Christ and the cup and the blood of Christ. People fail to see that association. <coughs> They're unworthy. They're taken unworthily. When he gave himself for our sins, a ransom for all, that's got to be correlated into this. Somewhere you've got to make these connections when you do this. It's especially important in an age when people do not have a dominating awareness of Christ. See, the truth of the matter is that there's a kind of preaching that exists in our time, to where people aren't left thinking about Jesus. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. They may be left thinking about Israel, or thinking about the law, or thinking about morality, or thinking about the family, or well, there's a lot of other things you can preach and leave an awareness of. Think about how marvelous the prophecies in Scripture are. You're left thinking about that mm -hmm. instead of about Jesus. Well, when you come to this table, you've got to be thinking about the right thing. Amen. Amen. Whatever helps you think about the right thing, do it. That's why we are open for people to quote the scripture that puts us in mind. Yeah. Mr. Logan will play a song that helps you think about these things, discipline your mind. Because it's important. When preaching and teaching is not centered in Jesus, the people are being set up for damnation. That's right. Because he already told you, whoever eats and drinks unworthy, eats and drinks damnation, or the, that's a hard word today, judgment is the idea, unto himself. So if you, don't pre if, you, if you have the kind of preaching going out to where people aren't left conscious of Jesus, 
it sets them up for being judged at the Lord's table because enough's not been said to remember Christ. Amen. There's been a deficiency yeah. in the preaching. And I tell you, preachers ought to be held accountable for this. There should not be negotiations with them. Yeah. They should be dispensed forthrightly, got out of the pulpit, yeah. and forbidden to preach. Amen. Now, the organized churches that think this way, they forbid other people to preach. Yeah. I was once forbidden to preach anywhere in the particular denomination, anywhere in the world. Forbidden. See? But people that preach hogwash, they're not forbidden. You can see the gravity of this because it's impacting people. It's, making, it's setting people up for divine judgment. Jesus can't be discerned by suddenly shifting gears. You, see, you come to this table and you suddenly you change the way you think. Well, that's, you can't do this. If you've been sitting there thinking about, you know, what you saw on the TV or something like that, you can't just suddenly whoop, whoop, flip the light switch and then hop into this remembrance mode. You can't do that. Why can't you? Because God geared you so you can't. Whatever you focus on, it's hard to change that focus. So if you've not been focusing on Jesus in your life, you're going to have a hard time, hard time focusing on him here. That's right, yep. And you've got to focus on him here. Really, you've got to focus in life on him, too. Yeah. Well, there's so much offered these days to people, my. So many activities, you know, family activities and children's activities. It's possibly more, more concerned about the education of your children than you are about them going to heaven. That's possible. We live in a society that does this. So the, there is, a, what I point out, there is a fact, it is a fact that you can eat and drink unworthily. In an unworthy man, in other words, God won't log this in the books that you remembered his son. That won't be in the books. There may be in the books like a double column over here. They took the Lord's Supper, but they didn't, they didn't focus on my son. You know, it's going to be logged. That's right. Make no mistake about this. Make no mistake about this. This, this is how it's going to be. And so uh, we thank God for the brothers and sisters who put us in mind of these things when they stand up uh, and speak to us or they pray for us. They put us in mind of this. They're all, all of these work together to help us to have a good, strong, and healthy remembrance at this table because we know if we don't have to do this in a worthy manner, Nobody should balk at this. Jesus is worthy of this kind of attention. Amen. When you think of the attention he gave you, yeah. he gave himself for me, he loved me and gave himself for me, Paul said. You can say the same thing. Well, it took a lot of attention, didn't it? Mm -hmm. He wasn't thinking about the Pharaoh. Oh, Lord, I wish the Pharisees, I wish they had believed. Mm -hmm. He didn't pray that in Gethsemane. He didn't pray it on the cross. That's right. He was thinking about it. he was thinking about the people he's dying for. Mm -hmm. Once we're going to receive it, I pray not for the world. He said on the eve of his death, I don't pray. I'm not even praying for the world now. Yeah, right. I'm not praying for them. Mm -hmm. I'm praying for those that believe on me, Amen. those that believe on me through their word. I'm yeah. praying for them all. Amen. That's what I'm praying for. Yeah. So if he did that, then why shouldn't we yes. reciprocate yeah. by thinking of him? Now, he that eateth and drink, so we don't want to warn you about eating and drinking unworthily. Not discerning the Lord's body, not making the correlation. I'm dealing with Jesus here. Mm -hmm. There's a sense in which I got Jesus in my hand. Uh -huh. And I can do with him whatsoever I please. There's a sense in which this is so. Just like it was looked like that's what Pilate could do whatever he wanted. Mm -hmm. It looks like you could do whatever you whatever you want. You can choose to let your mind drift off on something else or to focus on Christ. It's in your hand. What you do is like it in your hand, but God's monitoring it. Whatever you do is not going to escape his attention for weal or for woe. 
Now with that in mind, God will not allow us to overlook a lack of discernment. He will not do it. He will not himself overlook a lack of discernment. He that eateth and drinketh unworthily eats and drinks damnation to himself. In other words, even in English, the word damnation, it, it isn't go to hell. It's not synonymous with go to hell. Although that's where, it's where it leads, we understand. The word even in the English means to condemn to a punishment. It's kind of a startling concept, isn't it? I mean, God will do something about this. Even in this world. And he's going to, going to tell you later that he, at Corinth they did something about it in this world. A lot of people's difficulties, they're like abnormal, and we've got to be very careful in saying this because this isn't necessarily the case, but it can be the case. It could be considered. A lot of people's difficulties can be traced back to their attitude at this table. God forbid that any of us should try and diagnose somebody else, but it's good to examine ourselves to see. Maybe this is the reason I've been um, having all this trouble. Maybe I haven't been able to focus properly on Christ. See, you think this way. Means judgment. At this table, there, there's a where closeness of the closeness of Christ and the remembrance of Christ is accented in improper so, an improper manner summons divine judgment. That's how serious Christ's death is. Amen. <coughs> the equation, like, he that believeth not shall be damned. You know, mm -hmm. If there's not a proper response to the Christ God sent, mm -hmm. every, if you're talking about believing on him, everybody kind of knows this. If you don't believe the record he's given of his son, everybody knows this, that God... Will will not tolerate that. Well, here's another. This is another area. We're talking about another area here that, that God is the same way. He will not tolerate an abuse of the remembrance of Christ, or a distorted remembrance of Christ, or a haphazard remembrance of Christ, or a half-baked remembrance of Christ, or one that's casual, or one that's not entered into heartily. He will not overlook it. Don't think that God's just full of mercy and he'll just overlook it. No, no, no. He won't do it. Mm -hmm. Because what Jesus did cost him too much. Oh, it was too difficult, I speak as a man, for God mm -hmm. to turn his face from his son. He will not allow us to do so. Amen. Amen. It's enough that God turned his face. That's enough. There shouldn't be anybody else ever turn their face from him. That was enough. Yes. Amen. So he'll not allow his beloved son to be treated as though he was common. Amen. Or as though he was an option on the table. Yeah. You know, you could take him or leave him. Those who have been freed from sin, God will not allow them to ignore the one who freed them. God will not permit it. Dogmatic about it. Some of them may say, Well, that, I thought God is full of grace and full of mercy. Yeah, He is, but don't tell that to Judas. There's some people, His love and mercy is not for them. You want God's love and mercy? You've got to receive Christ, live for Christ, think of Christ, die for Christ, for Him to advantage you. It's the way God set it up. Why? Because he gets glory that way. What glory does God get out of a Savior that's not recognized? This, this doesn't bring any glory to God. It doesn't honor God for him to save somebody that was didn't think of his son. Amen. This doesn't honor God. This, this makes God appear different than he really is. Mm -hmm. God, you're, sa you're not saved by God's love. You're saved by God's righteousness. Yes, amen. See, your sins aren't forgiven because God loved you. Your sins, the righteousness of God has been declared for the forgiveness of sin. The scripture category says this in Romans the third chapter. To declare his righteousness for the remission of sin. So your sins are forgiven by God's righteousness. It's a judicial act. It's an official 
act. So not to remember that. You got clemency because of Christ. Yeah. Not to remember that. See, that is a, that's a serious offense. In Corinth, the proper distinction was not made between the Lord's table and an ordinary meal. Yeah. Now they came together and they had a meal. And some people still do this uh, today. They go by patterns. They say, there you are, the early church always observed the love feast with the Lord's table and blah, blah. And they, these people just don't know what they're talking about. They're not scripturally literate. You shouldn't pay any attention to them at all. Because if what they're saying is not true. That is what Corinth was doing. They had an agape feast at the Lord's table. And it ended up they were condemned because of it. He said, you got houses to eat in. You got no business to come together just to eat. I used to preach in country churches where when they'd had the potluck, every dog would come out from the, from the woods, every dog of the church members probably turned up. They didn't like me because I'd send them home. I said, you got no right to be here. Amen. He said, we've been a member of this church. I said, well, I had no idea. Yeah. I never seen you. So, I mean, we're not going to send someone out to bind you and send you away, but you're not welcome here. And I hope nobody talks to you while you're here. Amen. Yeah, yeah. well, you, some of us... <laughs> seen that as well. Yeah, you've seen it. That's what happened to Corinth. Yeah, yeah. What happened to all the rich folk, they had a special table. Yeah, uh -huh. Everybody told them, you ate your drunk. He didn't mean inebriated, not what he meant. He meant you were, you're filled and here's the other person over here. All they could bring, all they could bring was a little crust of bread. Uh -huh. So they're just saying, come over. Mm -hmm. We'll share ours. They said, you eat your crusts over there and we'll eat ours over here. And the meal upstaged the Lord's table. Amen. Amen. That's what happened. Yeah. And they came together, actually, for condemnation. They came together to eat instead of take the Lord's Supper. So their own pleasure upstaged rejoicing in the Lord, which is a common practice, see? It upstaged it. And there was, as a, as a consequence, there was a judgment rendered. He said... Um, Many are weak and sickly among you, and some sleep. For this cause, because you didn't discern the Lord's body, because you partook of it unworthy. For this cause, many are weak and sickly. Now that probably applies preeminently to physical health, but it does to spiritual health too. Yes, that's right. Amen. There are some people that are weak and sickly spiritually. And it's because they haven't had a proper connection with Jesus because Jesus will make you stand. Jesus will keep you from calling, falling. Jesus will lift you up. See, Jesus, Jesus will minister to you. But if you're like this far off, it doesn't happen. If you have an improper attitude toward Jesus, you don't receive the benefits of Jesus ministering because they're all ministered from close up. None of them are, listed from a, are, are ministered from a distance. They're all ministered from close up, see. So for this cause, many are weak and sickly, and some of you, some of you sleep, some of you died. Now I don't know if there was like a plague. It doesn't tell you how this all happened. Whether there was like a plague sent on the church and a lot of people died, we don't know. I don't want to know. <laughs> I just enough to know that this happened. You didn't. If Paul had not said this. There'd be a whole host of people that would argue with you on this point. Yeah, that's right. Oh, yeah. They would say God would never do something like that. Well, they would, and even though well, this is in the scripture, some people would say that they would. God did never do that. Well, God did do that. Here's an example. Amen. He did it, and He did it to a church that was, a, it was the first Pentecostal charismatic church. Yeah, that's right. They lacked in no gift, mm -hmm. right? What it says: yeah. you come behind in no gift. And just to show you that that doesn't make anybody superior. <laughs> Some of them were sick and died because of this. So see that what it gifts their gifts, their gifts didn't help them survive. Why? Because they weren't ministered the right way if they were ministered at all. Some places I have been that the Lord's table gave place to gifts. Someone to have a prophecy, they'd be given a prophecy, and they would 
It puts the Lord's table aside, defer to the prophecy. Mm -hmm. No, not at this table. You don't defer to anything. Now this kind of judgment, as you know, can be avoided. Yeah. He was very careful to tell the Corinthians it could be avoided. 1 Corinthians 11, 31, he says, If we should judge ourselves, we should not be judged. That it, judge ourselves, that's to examine ourselves. Mm -hmm. So you can discern the Lord's body. In other words, as you examine yourself, you're probing to see evidence that you're the elect of God. Then it'll clear up your eyes so you can see, you can discern Christ. You're not thinking about bread, cup. You're not thinking about that. You're thinking about body, blood. You see, you're thinking about Christ. You've made the transition. Your mind's not limited. See, your mind can re reach way back and go way forward. Whereas you, your memory, your memory can recollect something like hundreds, a couple thousand years ago took place. It could lay hold of it back there. And then it can look forward to the coming of Christ and bask in that. And Christ is, Christ is the pivot on which this all occurs. See, you're able to recall remission, forgiveness, and peace, and reconciliation, and knocking down the middle wall of partition, and taking away the handwriting of ordinances, and spoiling principles and powers, and destroying the devil, and you're able to remember all that because you're focused on Christ. Uh -huh, yeah. See, he's the one that did that, so when you think about Christ, and that awakens all of these other things that give you this joy unspeakable, full of glory, as Sister Melissa was talking about. See, the recollection of Christ throws you in that kind of a mode. All of a sudden, you can see clearer and remember better. And that's how the kingdom's set up. Yeah. This is how God is... I'm about to say organized. That's not a good word, but this is how God has instituted it. Yeah. So that as a tension... Very real attention is paid to his son, then that opens up all the other areas of the kingdom that are necessary for you to survive. Amen. Amen. That's what unlocks all those things. So some people have a hard time remembering what Christ has done. They forget they're for purged from their old sins. They forget they're purged from their old sins. The reason they did is because they forgot Christ. They would think on Christ. As soon as you bring Christ into the equation, then all of a sudden these other matters, they're, they're illuminated and become prominent in your thinking. You found it to be so, I know. So if we judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we're judged, we're chastened of the Lord. That would be th some of the illnesses and that, maybe even the death. <coughs> that we should not be condemned with the world. Yeah. Now if you can receive it, the only piece, way some people can be saved is God is to take their life. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's, it's, it's terrible to say. It's a terrible to say it. Isn't it? But that's what that the spirit might be saved. Mm -hmm. Amen. To commit that point again, commit him to the de to the devil that his spirit might be yeah. saved. Uh -huh. See, so that's there's some people that God's got to just I take take it away. I take it this is the way it works, and I. I govern my own prayers this way. There's certain people I pray for this way. That when you find, Lord, when you find them in an acceptable state, they have this ten tendency to vacillate and go. So whenever they're in an acceptable state, just, just take them. That's what, I, that's what I think this means here. Sometimes they're not over the edge, but they're on the way to toppling off the edge. So God just cuts their life short so they can be saved. <laughs> Well, I don't, I'll be perfectly honest with you. I don't want to be saved that way. Yeah. Uh -huh. I think that possibly it has some handicaps on the other side, even so. Yeah, I don't want to be saved that way. I don't want. I don't want the Lord to have to take me to save me. I want him, if He takes me, I want Him to take me because He He wants my fellowship, and yeah. I want His. See, there's a difference between being taken like that, these people, and being taken like Enoch was. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Enoch was taken because. He was getting closer, closer, closer. So if, if I was going to die, this the Lord's table would be a good, good time to die. I guess Amen. if you really want to look at it that way, yeah. don't hold it against me if that ever happens. I mean, just kind of rejoice with me and handle the death the best you can. But you can see what I'm saying, can't you? 
You can you can get close enough to God. God doesn't want any more separation. Yes, that's right. Be absent from the body, be present with the Lord. To be in the bodies, be absent from the Lord. There, there is such a thing as God not wanting any more absence. That's enough. We had enough absence, so I'm going to just take you to myself. I'm going to call you home. Amen. Oh, God, hasten the day. Be good. And if he doesn't take you, that doesn't necessarily mean you're not ready. It can mean you're not done yet. Yeah, that's right. Can't mean that. You've got to decipher that. That's a good thing to decipher this table too. That's right. Is it that I'm 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 finished my work? Yeah. If that's the case, then I don't refuse. Then I I'm, I consent. I'm willing to be absent from the body. If I if it's that I haven't finished my work, I'm willing to be absent from the body. But as Paul said, it was necessary for you Philippians that I stay. Yeah. I always like to have that on your conscience. Yeah. Paul wanted to go to be with the Lord, but he had to stay because of us. <laughs> huh? Yeah. That's the truth. That's what, that's what he said. In other words, God's not looking for a reason to condemn anybody. Right. Amen. See, he prefer to correct you by chastening. But you've got to be able to recognize chastening. See, if you've got a distorted view of chastening... God could be chasing you, but the way you've been taught, you don't think it's chasing. You just think it's happenstance. Or things just aren't going right. Or everybody's against me. Or the boss doesn't like me. Or you got, or this is a climate. The climate is awakening my asthma. Or whatever, whatever. You credit to something else. But when you're close to God, you bring these into the equation. And then if you're wrong about it, and this is not really a judgment from God. God will clear it up. Mm -hmm. He'll clear it up to you so you won't, th you won't think wrongly about it. But you've got to be close. And this table is part of getting close mm -hmm. to him. <coughs> now this, uh, this passage, as we have, has been pointed out, is to promote introspection and sobriety, among other things. Why? Because in... Living for God, these are two essentials. Introspection, examining yourself, searching yourself, and sobriety. Yeah. And this, this table contributes to this, see? If you don't remember Jesus, the sobriety begins to go down. And the zeal begins to go down. Because Jesus is the cause for all things that are contribute to growth, advance, Jesus is the cause of it. So if, if Jesus is reduced, all the effects are correspondingly reduced. See? Mm -hmm. So Paul says to the people at Corinth, Now, if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together under condemnation. You say, does that mean it's wrong to eat together? No, it's wrong to let eating together upstage remembering Christ. Yeah. See, you got to, this is what he's talking about. Yeah. Then he says to them, after he said that, he said, the rest I'll set in order when I come. I mean, there's a lot of stuff, it's a lot of stuff at Corinth we got to get straightened out. I'm not able to do it now, but <laughs> we got to work on this right away, or otherwise some of you won't be there when I do come. To straighten out. The rest I'll set in order when they come. So, so this instruction he gave about the Lord's table was setting in order. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Was setting things in order at Corinth. Now if it was in our day, this statement in our day, it would be something like this. He said, now folks, we're going to we're going to have to put the communion table up in the front again. Yeah. And we're going to have to exclude the elders that don't know anything from presiding at it. Amen. And the people that pass it around among the people are going to have to be attired so they are not a distraction. Right. These will be setting things in order. In other words, you've got to... An environment has to be created in which God can work. God will not work in an environment that has, in fact, excluded his son. Amen. He, he will not work in that kind of a situation. No matter how many gifts a person has, yeah. no matter how many prophets and words of knowledge and words of wisdom and speaking in tongues, and all, no matter how much of that happens, if Jesus isn't given the prominence, God will not work in that yes. type of environment. Now, 
Think of it this way, brethren. Aren't you thankful that, in a sense, it's been greatly simplified? Been greatly simplified. God being among us has been great. It's not a matter that you, you ask, oh, God, I hope you meet with us today. I sure hope God meets with us today. If you have this proper attitude toward his son, <laughs> that's the last thing you got to worry about, is if God's going to be with us or not. He will be with us, and he will be among us, and it will be a favorable, he'll be favorably inclined toward us. Because he said, if, Jesus said, if any man honors the Son, him the Father will honor. Amen. See, having to judge God's people, having to chasten God's people, that is not an honor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the honor, that means you can, you can have a correspondingly great blessing mm -hmm. at this table. If God will do this, judge those who do it unworthily, you should not need any further word about what he'll do about those who do it worthily. Amen. Yeah. He will. Well, you just don't know how, how great he'll be blessed. There's no way to estimate yeah. what can actually happen at this, at this table. So I commit these things to you for uh, consideration. But Aaron has our exhortation.